Mr. Anderson, our associate superintendent, Mr. Larson, our business administrator, and our attorney, uh, Mr. Van Komen. We are going to start out tonight with a discussion on the infrastructure by Harriman City that we need put in place for our new elementary school in Harriman. I am going to um, turn the time to Mr. Dunford to start out. He's the chair of our facilities committee, and our facilities committee has been working very closely on this and, and monitoring um, this situation. We also have um, Mr. Robinson and Ms. George who've been meeting with Harriman City. So we'll start out with Mr. Dunford. We are nearing completion of a new elementary school in Harriman. It is a beautiful building on a beautiful site. We have run into occasionally some snags in terms of the infrastructure, getting electricity and water in and sewer out, um, as we have communicated back and forth with Harriman. And wanting to be open and put on public record so that everyone can kind of know as we come to an expected open date, a little bit of the history. Um, the decision that is going to be critical is in January at our board meeting, we are going to hear a recommendation from the superintendent as to whether we open this school in 2022 as expected or because of infrastructure delays, we push the opening of the school to 2023. And should that be the case, I would like the board and the public to understand the history of our interactions so that we all know where we are and what needs to happen between now and that January board meeting. Um, and I n we're not taking action tonight as much as we're informing the board and letting everyone in the public know where we stand and what needs to happen in order to open in 2022 and if it doesn't happen by which dates, we would delay the opening till 2023. So I've asked Mr. Thomas, our Director of Auxiliary Services, to walk through the interaction with um, Harriman City over this school so that this board and everyone listening can understand exactly what has taken place in trying to set up for a 2022 opening. Um, and then when he's done, we'd like to ask uh, Mr. Robinson and Miss George, who attended the meeting with Harriman City recently, to tell us where we currently stand. And then we'll ask the superintendent to tell us exactly, this is the course we're on, and this is what would happen to change the course that we're on. So we're going to start with Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, like Mr. Dunford said, we've been working with Harriman City uh, very closely for over 16 months now as we prepare to, uh, you know, as we've been constructing and preparing to open this school in the Hidden Oaks development. Um, and, and I can go back. It's quite an extensive um, list of dates that we've met, but we've met regularly with them uh, at least monthly and, you know, staff to staff. And then we've met um, really every other Thursday just for regular updates. The main concerns that, that have been brought to uh, especially the facility committee and and the board's aware of most of these is uh, the reimbursement agreement between Harriman City and Irie in which uh, Irie was going to put in all of the infrastructure both the the uh, temporary infrastructure for the construction of the school and the permanent inf infrastructure and so I believe the board's aware of all of those uh, all of those attempts to work through those issues and we've gotten to the point now where uh, we received a letter from the city. We, we've given them a number of critical pathway dates and a number of um, schedules that were good for us that would allow us to do those things uh, to have the school open on time. And we really haven't gotten there. So on the 1st of December, we received a revised schedule from Blake Thomas with Harriman City that kind of outlined um, where they believed, working with Ivory, where they believed that we could uh, you know, have those have those uh, utilities in, and a lot of those, the majority of those, were end of May, beginning of June. That was of great concern because, as you know, we we uh, actually have the principal and some limited staff in the building around the first of June. So, uh, we we quickly got back to them. I know Mr. Rostrom worked with uh, worked with the city and worked with Hughes. Hughes Construction said, 
they, they, they got back and indicated that that would be very, very difficult for them. Our substantial completion for Hughes Construction is June 1st, which means our contract is basically up with them unless they haven't finished the school and then they stay. But they're actually uh, on or ahead of schedule for most of the school. So anything beyond that, we would be required to pay general conditions to Hughes Construction. Um, if they had to extend their contract, they're also committed to go to other projects. So we communicated that back, to, and it also would not allow us to have the appropriate time to plan for or open the new school on time. So we basically got back to Harriman City and let them know that we had we had, had those meetings, and we, we basically uh, gave them a, a revised date in, in close collaboration with Hughes Construction. They felt like we really couldn't go outside of April 1st, 2022 to have those things in place to open the school successfully. There's a, a lot of testing that takes place, um, uh, life safety testing, water, you know, water, um, gas, all the utilities. They wanted to have fire hydrants in that we still don't have right now, and that's a, that's a concern in the event that there were a fire. We basically constructed the school using water trucks, generators, and, um, and propane. So we got back to them. Um, it, was, it was suggested that we have a meeting as soon as possible and kind of get all the players together. So we did that on December 7th. And I'll, if, if we want, um, Ms. George or Mr. Robinson, if you'd like me to kind of relay the details of that meeting, or you can, you're okay. Uh, please check my work. <laughs> so we, we met with the city and after consultation with the board and the superintendent and, and other administrators, we decided that uh, we would get back to them and relay that April 1st was really our outside date for all those utilities to be in and that the district would like a commitment letter from the city and some sort of evidence from the contractor, whether that be an agreement or uh, an updated uh, timeline that would give the, the board confidence that we could move forward and have those things in place and that the board would, and if we couldn't, then the board would need to make decisions with the superintendent and regarding either the opening or the delay of school. So the meeting itself was was not much more than that. I think we made a good point. Um, Councilwoman Orn was there and she she basically said, oh, and here was the other condition, was that the board needed to know, we needed to have a commitment no later than January 13th, which is the day after their first uh, council meeting in January. And um, Councilwoman Orn, Orm, is it Orm or Orn? Orm, indicated that uh, she really didn't feel like the council needed to be part of that since they've already made the budget adjustments necessary to pay for those utilities, so to, to move forward. Um, but that's kind of how we left the meeting. Ms. George or Mr. Robinson, any, anything more than that? I would just add that, um, sorry. You would think I would know that after listening on a phone. Um, I would just add that it seemed like things would go a lot faster than the January 12th or 13th date. So in the meeting, they made arrangements to send the big holdup right now has been a reimbursement agreement f between the city and ivory they said that would be sent out by the end of the day that day and that they would meet with ivory and iron things out by this week so while we gave them that date in january i'm hopeful that we will have news sooner yeah so if so if i'm understanding from what you've said, Mr. Thomas and Ms. George, um, we could go ahead and pursue this because they don't need to meet as a council in order to get it going. Is that correct? So I, th I think I think the message that we sent there was the, the board would like to know an answer. They'd like to have either the commitment or not a commitment by that date in a letter and some evidence by January 13th so that the board can make decisions with the administration regarding how we move forward. And we have not received that letter, is that correct? That is correct. So I, I pushed, uh, I, I talked to uh, Blake Thomas today. I said, can you give me any updates before I go back to the board? And he said today, this was as of 2 o'clock, he said, uh, Harriman indicated that Ivory is in possession of the reimbursement agreement now and is waiting for an updated revised timeline from Ivory. They indicated that they don't believe or see any issues with hitting the April 1st deadline with all utilities. Their main concern is uh, a supply issue with the sewer manhole covers. Uh, they're having supply chain issues as well and possibly winter and, and weather. 
I asked about a letter, and he said they would like to get authorization from the entire council before sending the commitment letter by uh, January 13th. So that there was one council uh, councilwoman there, but they want to go to the whole council and say, can we send the commitment letter? And that we would have it one way or the other, and, and an updated schedule. So that's, that's the latest as of 2 o'clock. And then what about the reimbursement agreement? Would so the reimbursement agreement... It? reimbursement agreement also be something we're looking for to ensure that the timeline is going to be met yeah so so the reimbursement agreement is between is between ivory and harriman and we're not party to the reimbursement agreement ivory's just doing the work for harriman but we could certainly get a copy of that um he indicated that they do now have the reimbursement agreement, but in the meeting, it was uh, Ben from Ivory indicated that once they receive the reimbursement agreement, they'll get it to their legal for review, and and I'm sure there will be some back and forth there for a while. So there's there's a little more confidence now that we're moving in a good direction, um, but they they still have that timeline to meet January 13th, and I'm so, happy to answer any questions. So Superintendent, I'm going to summarize, and you correct you chime in okay. the last official communication we have received from them puts the completion date beyond our target so as of right now the course we're on is to open in 2023 unless we receive a commitment to complete by april 1st and evidence that they will do so so the Correct me if I'm wrong, but the course we're on right now is to open in 2023, not 2022, unless those items come in and are received by the district sometime in January. The last course voted on by the board was that the school would open in 2022. So that is our current course. If we do not receive a letter by the date indicated in January, uh, committing that the city can provide the needed infrastructure by April 1st, then I would make a recommendation to the board that we delay that opening to 2023. So currently the course remains 2022, but I would recommendation I would make a re recommendation to delay that if we don't get the letter in January that we've asked for. Okay, that's why, the clarification. Why would we delay it a whole year? Well, that's what I was going to ask, Mr. Robinson. It isn't unheard of to open a school mid-year. No, not We've at done all. it. We've done it. Not at all. Would you like me to address that now? Yes. Absolutely. I, um, I've talked with a number of administrators who supervise and work at the elementary level, and I think opening an elementary virtually is a different thing from what we've done to this point. And I, the reason I would not recommend doing that is because of the difficulty that we already have, not difficulty, but the effort that's already required to build a community with a new school and connect students to their teacher. And so that's one worry. We have opened school virtually for elementary students who chose to be part of our virtual school but we did not do that except for a any student who chose that and a teacher who had been assigned to do that. We switched to virtual in 2020, of course, in, in March of 2020. And then we started students virtually who had chosen that for the year. But starting a brand new school with new boundaries and doing all of that and starting that virtually is not something we've done before and not something I would recommend. I just don't think it's in the best interest of students to do that. So, so I never the other, I never said anything about virtual. There's state there's schools all over the state that open mid year without a virtual component. My other concern is that we say, well, it'll probably be two weeks, and we keep bumping the deadline, which has already been bumped, and we're not really sure that it'll be two weeks. Maybe it'll be a month. The supply chains and other factors are such that if we don't have that commitment well in advance. I, I think we're rolling the dice, and I'm very concerned about doing that. And I think it would be detrimental to students to have things so up in the air. That's why I would make that recommendation. Now, based on what Mr. Thomas has told me, I'm optimistic that we won't need to explore that, and hopefully we can have that letter and assurance. 
I know a lot of work is being done to to get us there. So I'm optimistic. But I'm also concerned at the idea that that that, that opening would be up in the air or delayed. Uh, if we knew, it's just a question of how long you can wait to get a solid date for opening. And I, I'm... I'm concerned that it's more detrimental to delay an opening and, and, and try to work around things than it is to simply wait and open on time for the following school year. So I don't understand that, but I just want to go on record. The problem here exists that our council's not, not communicating with their council. We have great staffs, and our staffs have been working well together. But even in the most recent meeting, um, a city council person or a mayor was not even invited. I had to go out and invite them. And what's happening is we have frustrations and problems, but their council and their mayor doesn't know about it. And so we just have to have a better job, do a better job at going and working with the city directly, let the staffs work. But like Mr. Thomas just talked about, they have to wait till um, the 13th. Well, that was not my understanding in the meeting. Clearly, the city manager said that they can get things rolling immediately. They don't need to wait a month. And, and same with the council person. And so I guess that's my frustration. My frustration is we're getting frustrated because we're not talking to their council. We're the decision makers, and the decision makers need to get together on a regular basis in, in the room and express our frustrations with this. And so I hope that this will you know, we'll continue to develop a relationship council to council. Question on delaying it, another question. Yes. So we have a boundary change that has already been voted on that goes into effect for this fall. If we delay it, do we have to do a new boundary change vote? No. With 120 day notice, or are we just delaying the boundary change? We're just delaying the boundary change effectivity the effective date of the boundary change right and january would give us enough time to announce that and meet all of the uh, meet all the deadlines that are established superintendent do you feel it's within your authority to make this decision or do you feel like you're going to make a recommendation to the board and the decision lies on the board's authority because the board voted previously on the boundaries and the timeline, I feel it's only appropriate for me to bring that back to the board. And although I'm telling you my recommendation now, of course, we can implement whatever the board asks us to put in place. But I'm just letting you know what my recommendation would be based on my conversations with uh, administrators and others at the elementary level. And just my concern for students, every time there's a transition, that's a difficulty and doubling up on that transition and having the uncertainty on top of it, I just don't think is best for students. So you'll be seeking a board vote in January. So any board member that's concerned about delaying or not will have an opportunity to make a decision then. If we receive a letter that indicates the city is committed to the April 1st timeline, then I won't need to bring that forward. If we do not receive that letter, then I would bring it forward, but I would encourage any questions from board members in the meantime. I'm happy to discuss options and, and concerns and thoughts about that, but I just, you know, it's students primarily, but it's also employees and teachers and everyone who's left kind of hanging in the balance if we don't have that information soon enough. The reason for the January date is because of all of the rollover that's required and families need time to plan and there's, there's just a lot involved. So we need to make a final decision in January if, uh, if, if we need to consider changes. I'd like to know your recommendation before you make one. My recommendation? When, when you get to that point. I can tell before you. Before that January meeting, I would like to have a conversation with you. We, we can absolutely talk about that. But my recommendation is to is that if we don't have the commitment that the work can be done by April 1st, that we delay by one year. But I'm, I'm saying I don't want you to recommend that to this board without having a conversation with me closer to that. that. Oh, sure. No, that's, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. And I, I'm just telling the board where I am at this point. Sure. 
but things will change and so i just want an update as we go sure and i appreciate you know what you're saying but i would ask that you keep an open mind about a possible mid-year opening because we do have the boundary in place we do have a principal and s some staff in place where would you house them well they'd stay in where they are schools? until in their current classes mixed right. classes and then right. at some point we rip them out of the current well classes. not rip don't use that word because they they will know ahead of time most of these people are come from a single school right well two schools right. I, I would just at least keep that option open what about hiring do you hire teachers and you can't leave them where they're at and you can hire and organize the, the classes the in their in those schools. You can plan toward that. I we've done it before. It's not that it's unheard of. I hate to see a school stay closed for a full year unused. I hate to see that. My feeling. I, I, I can give a little more information about that. First off, the fact that I'm making a recommendation now is just information for the board and for others. I don't want anyone to have the impression that. We have a plan B all ready to go, and we think it'll work out fine if we need to delay. I, I'm just giving my opinion as superintendent and what my recommendation will be. It doesn't mean I'm not open-minded about it. I feel strongly about it, but I'm certainly open-minded uh, and willing to, to consider any input from the board or any additional information. And as I said, if there's a vote in another direction, we can implement as I think we've shown, whatever the board asks us to put in place. But hiring becomes very difficult, and we've, we've, and it's just, it, it's a disruption to learning on top of the disruptions we've already experienced over the last two years that makes me very hesitant to, to move in that direction. Again, I'm, I'm always open to discussion. I always want to find the best way forward, but I currently, after a lot of discussion, see the best way forward as a delay now that doesn't mean that the building I, I think we would need a custodian for the building um, to keep an eye out on it for that year and I think we could make some use of the building for various events and trainings and other things during the course of the year but that's just my initial that's that's my initial uh, recommendation I think I'd like to just share that I mean we, we I know that I've heard a lot of information about you know, students haven't had a quote unquote normal year for three years. And then to put that on another year seems very difficult and very unsettling for students, I think. And then not to only mention that if we place kids in or keep the kids in the schools that they're in, we have hired those teachers. And then in the mid year, we go to the new school and have the teachers there and then we have teachers that have half full classrooms. I mean, I understand it could be a transition and I do believe that our superintendent is mindful about all of those things, but when it comes down to it, we absolutely need to be more mindful about what is best for students. It happens all over Bond the state is all so I'm much. saying. It well, happens all over the state, that's what I'm saying, is mid-year openings are not unheard of. They're not, but so neither there's processes, has the last three years for Process is set in line with those districts of how they've been able to accomplish it. So my question is, why are we not even exploring that? I mean, what if we're a week late, you know, and then, oh, sorry, it's going to be a year, you know? I mean, that's my concern. The, Which the, is a debate, really, for another day. Because yeah. as be. of right now, the course we're on is to completely avoid that discussion. And, well, like we're borrowing trouble mm, right the course now. we're on is it'd be a couple months late. Yeah, and and like I said, I'm I'm optimistic that things will be in place and that we'll be able to open. So hopefully, we don't have to go down that road at all. And I don't want to suggest that we haven't even explored the possibility. Uh, we've absolutely explored all of the options just because I have a recommendation I, I don't mean that to suggest that we haven't looked at everything the only reason I have a recommendation is because we have in fact explored some other options and just determined that the very best thing is either to open on time or to open the the following year and the other the other question is it's just a timeline issue there's the commitment to April 1st which we think will allow everything to fall in line. That doesn't mean everything goes perfectly from there, but 
if if everything is lined up to where a commi- commitment can be made for April first, then 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 we can open on time. It's it's not going to be a call at the last minute like, well, we just need another week or that. If we have that decision in January, then we feel confident about moving everything forward. I feel like the thing that makes this situation unique to many others is that we're we're building from scratch. We have nothing. And so when Hughes is done with their contract and they leave and we don't have, if we don't have everything in place, how, I mean, we couldn't have signed off on the school yet. And so I just think those are apples and oranges. These are completely different scenarios than anything else that our district has done. But they can give us commitment to April 1st and it may not happen because of supply problems. So we better be able to change on a dime anyways because not everything is under control. At that meeting, it sounded like HADCO had placed orders two months ago. Everything's ordered. Everything seems like it is on schedule from that angle. And Mr. Robinson, that's an important point. We can always adjust to what ends up happening. It's just planning to have to adjust is not something that I'm comfortable with. Adjusting when we need to is something that we've done in with a great deal of frequency over the last couple of years. It's just... Know, knowing where things are headed in January and making a decision based on that. Again, I think this is a breakdown between our school leadership and the city leadership. We need to have better communication. That's my opinion. And we appreciate you and Ms. George for having that communication and having those meetings. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, thank you. This is helpful information it's a good conversation a needed conversation that we need to have and uh, we look forward to hearing a report in January of what has happened okay next up on the agenda is a review of updates to administrative policy DA 165 apprenticeship program for our facility services department we have mr. Larson uh, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Rostrum. Want to start, Mr. Larson? Yes, uh, thank you. And President Miller, they're needing to take down the stream for just a couple of seconds to fix one, fix something, and they'll okay. bring it right back up. Okay. So I'm just going to delay here for a second <laughs> so that they can get the get it back up. You good? Yeah. Okay. So um, this policy um, has been. Uh, uh, under some discussion for a while. Our facilities group as well as our uh, JESPA partners in the Joint Relations Committee have talked about this <coughs> and have encouraged a, a change uh, to this policy to allow uh, or to encourage a few more participants. As you know, we, we have a bit of a, a challenge in hiring uh, maintenance workers in certain areas and so we're hoping to fire up the apprenticeship program a little bit by with this change and see if we can encourage some people that have actually expressed interest in this to participate and then fill some positions for that. Um, so that's the process we've been to. The, the change itself is pretty minor on the third page. Um, do you want me to go over that, Scott, or do you want to? I can. Or, Please, yeah, go ahead. It, the change is to allow a, a current employee to come in and do the apprenticeship program, but they'll, their salary placement would be up to one of these positions, uh, these lane positions. Therefore, uh, if someone came in and said, hey, I would like to, to become an apprentice for whatever one of the facilities positions might be, It'd be categorized as a trade one, two, or three, and then we know where they can be placed up to. If they're currently, if their current assignment is less than that lane, then they would stay, uh, stay at that lane where they're currently paid as they do the apprenticeship. But if their current assignment is above that lane, then they would go down to this maximum lane 
uh, while they're doing the apprenticeship. And then when they're done with the apprenticeship, then they would come in at the full level of the uh, regular position. So this would, this would impact you know, people that are just wanting to try something different? Yeah. Maybe current employees that, yeah, it could that are be, interested in a different job? Mm -hmm. Could be a custodian who wants to learn to be a... Uh, general trades. General trades. Um, wants to learn to become a... What's another good example, yeah, Dave? <laughs> electrician, a plumber. So there's been a lot of interest, but the way it's currently set up, if, if they take on an apprenticeship, they have to go back to a lane three. And a lot of our custodians and some of our grounds people are, are on a lane four or five or six. And uh, they just are struggling being able to take the cut in pay to go back to the apprenticeship as well as they have to, they have to fund their own apprenticeship. So any schooling involved is up to the employee as well. So there's been a lot of interest of, yeah, we'd like to get into these other trades, but we just struggle on taking the cutting and pay. So this would allow them to, to be able to come over at their current rate, kind of freeze them at that level until the apprenticeship program catches up to them. It, before it kind of de-incentivized people to, for, you know, to have some career mobility, they would say, you know, if you had a custodian that was, or somebody on grounds that was a lane six, and they said, well, I'd like to go into general trades or try something, and then they were a lane three for a year or two. Just to, so this kind of freezes them where they're at. They get through the appropriate apprenticeship and all the work that goes along with that and, and kind of holds them harmless at that lane. Um, but they can't go above these lanes. So a good example would be if you're a, at a custodian, let's say you're on a lane eight and you decide that you want to be a trades three apprentice, you would have to go to the six. But if you're a lane six on the grounds crew and you want to do the same thing, you would stay there at that, at that level. I just have one comment on uh, number five, the last sentence. For me, it doesn't read really well. Um, his or her lane will not be increased. I think there needs, that next part needs to be set off either in commas or parentheses so that it reads clearer. Maybe I'm the only one, but. Okay. So his or her lane will not be increased, comma, until completion, the completion of, the, of training the training program, program comma, comma, higher than his, because yeah. Okay. Sense? Yep. Any questions or concerns from board members? It makes a lot of sense. Seems yeah. like it would be a, yes. a good change to make. Give yeah. current employees more opportunities and help us at the same time. Mm hmm Help positions. Okay. Um, any need to bring it back again, or should we go ahead and plan on voting on it in our January board meeting? Okay. January? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is a review of updates to administrative policy DP309 salary guidelines. Dr. LeMaster, welcome. Hello. Thank you so here this evening. I have a bit of a cold, so I apologize. <coughs> The proposed changes you see um, or that are brought forth this evening on DP 309 negotiated simply reflect the changes of the Utah um, Board of Education with regard to licensing, specifically the associate license. So the first change you encounter is on 2G. Um, the state no longer will recognize the alternative route to licensure, the ARL, the APT, or the ATP in the LOA. They'll just refer to those as all associate level licenses. So that's why you see that reflected in here that we've removed that language and we're just calling them associates. So as people move 
um, toward their professional license um, is when their advancement in their salary change will be processed. And then there's another change on letter H4, again removing the terminology that's no longer applicable, the APT, ARL, and the ATP. Those will be dissolved at the end of this year, so we're just anticipating the changes coming forth. And what number four says is credit for educational advanced advancement salary changes for teachers receiving licensure through an alternative pathway will be granted only following completion of their professional licensure program. Salary educational advancement changes will be awarded as noted in AA421, which is on your agenda tonight to be approved. So there's consistency in the language between the two policies. Do you have any questions for me? It's a pretty simple change. <laughs> it also makes sense. It does. Right forward. Yeah. Thank you, and happy holidays. Hey, thank you. And we'll also plan on voting on this one in January. <coughs> okay, next up we have a housing report to consider boundary change for future growth affecting undeveloped areas within Ridgeview Elementary School boundaries. Um, Mr. Anderson and Ms. Gadosh and Mr. Elton, yeah, welcome. We've invited Mr. Festin to be here. Festin, sorry. <clears throat> While we're getting that pulled up, um, I just want to thank the efforts of, of Mr. Festin and and his his team. Uh, we've all uh, been working on this for some time and driving the area. I know they've been out there. I personally drove it last night again and just trying to get the lay of the land and and give you some uh, you know the housing report itself and some context to what's going on out there and some potential options for consideration. Um, Yeah, so uh, this is the area in which we're talking about. And just to kind of orient uh, members of the board here, this is, uh, this is Mountain Ridge High School, where I'm <coughs> hovering my, my mouse. Next to it, right here, this, build, this white building here, is, is uh, Ridgeview Elementary School. And this is the area in which we're considering. And the board asked us to consider options that we have available, um, considering especially those areas that may be undeveloped at this point. And so at this point, we have up here in the, um, the north and east quadrant of this screen here, Hidden Pines. That's uh, near S uh, South Hills Middle School. This was a development that opened. They, they split a, a, a large estate in that area. It originally had 39 units. There are only three uh, that are still undeveloped. So that's mostly built out. The large area here, just to the, the north of Ridgeview Elementary, is called the Mountain Ridge Development. And we anticipate 106 single-family dwellings to go there with an additional 177 townhouse units that we know of um, at this point. Those are the permits that are pulled at this point. Or right, the, that, that, that is how many permits have been issued so far this year. As you can see, we have over 1,300 that are remaining there, so it's largely undeveloped. Uh, we have the, the Belvea, um, undeveloped area here just south of the school with 183 townhouse units with only 13 remaining. And then up here down to the south and to the west of the school is Juniper Crest. It's built out here. However, they're in this light shaded purple section here. There is an undeveloped area with a timeline to be determined and announced later on. So there is some undeveloped area um, there as well. I want to just go over the, the extreme growth that this area has experienced. On the left, you'll see um, uh, a photo taken in August of 2020. And you'll see, you'll notice here are the two schools, elementary to the right and high school to the middle. One month and one year later, just over a year later, we have <coughs> extreme development going on um, with, you can see the, the the dots in the black there are actually built out and completed housing developments with a lot more dirt being moved all around the school. 
Okay, and that's as of um, September of this year. So we're experiencing extreme growth here, and you, that we've, um, we've got a, a graph here that kind of illustrates that. The red dotted line at the bottom is the current use capacity of Ridgeview Elementary. Ridgeview currently has six portables, which gives it the use capacity of 1,100 students uh, for a capacity. The blue line above that, that that rises there is the anticipated or the projected enrollment over the next few years. This graph begins in the year 2022. So next school year, the school is anticipated to be at just over 1,200 students. By 2023, they'll add another 150 or so students. By the next year, there'll be over 1,500 students. Um, as we give these projections, I think it's important to, to just point out some caveats with, with growth projections that uh, they are they are variables and they can they can change with um, disruptions in the economy, um, housing costs, and other other things that we all know all too well, um, which can impact projections one way or the other. Uh, but you can see it crescendos by about the year 2026, and then tapers off, or will will stay largely um, steady after that. Please interrupt or, or, or just uh, sh stop me for any questions or, or clarifications along the way. When we um, offer considerations for options, they're just this. This is a beginning point. This is going to be different than, our, than a, a, a boundary change discussion where we've, op in, the, in the traditional sense, where we've op uh, given you option one, two, or three, or whatever. These are just areas for consideration and things to consider with Ridgeview. <coughs> With additional portables, it's important to know that Ridgeview can absorb the growth through all of next school year. So we're planning on, on adding some portables. We can get through next school year. After that, you know, by the 23-24 school year, we'll re need roughly three space for 350 additional students than what they have right now. Um, a lot of the undeveloped area. Can I stop you, you on that? Please. So what would the growth be i would imagine we could put more than six there we can't we've we have three schools in harriman that have double digits so uh, what would the gr what would the amount of students be allowed to be at that school if we went to 10 or more yeah it's an excellent question we have a slide that i think will illustrate okay. that coming up we've got an aerial view of the school with where we could we can show you you know what what portable options are available and where we where you know we can discuss Perfect. comfort level and things okay. like that so thank you for asking that um, when we talk about the undeveloped areas which is kind of what we initially focused on as you saw on the map earlier the undeveloped areas are within a few minutes walk if that um, to the school and so we would be potentially looking at pocket busing students that live within walking distance and that would mean additional buses and, and drivers and so forth so i wanted to make uh, the board aware of that also keep in mind that any boundary change now by state law requires a 120 day notification prior to um, the board approving uh, they need to be notified before the board can formally approve a boundary change can i ask a question on that we usually do it at a certain time of the year the time of the year is our internal process right we could do this any time of the year especially if it's with unincorporated that's unbuilt correct. areas that's okay. that's correct there is no time timeline established by law it just is required that whenever you want the the boundary to be officially changed and in effect you need to notify the cities or city or cities that impact are impacted and the residents of the school that may schools that may be impacted 120 days in advance thank you um, the other thing that, that could impact the, the rate of development is the construction of labor costs and the materials, and, and we all know about supply chains and other things that could impact some of these um, projections. Housing afford affordability could impact student yields. Um, it, when we're talking about an elementary school, uh, the, the larger the home value and the price on the home, the smaller the elementary school a student yield of each home. So that could impact it. So we want to, uh, again, look at a little closer at the areas I, I highlighted earlier. This is just, a, again, a lay of the land with the current boundary you can see outlined here in, in the red maroon area. Uh, the school is, is located in the center of this boundary right here. To the south, we've got Real Academy and the RSL Stadium. And then to the, the north, we have South Hills Middle. This is Mountain View Corridor that runs along here. So that's just kind of give you context of where we're talking here. Um, 
one option, one area to consider for a potential boundary change would be the Mountain Ridge area. That's the area just to the north there. That's the current, it's currently undeveloped. Uh, it, for the most part, it's developing. But um, we could look at pocket busing students from here to other schools that may include, but not limited to, Bluffdale, Harriman, Rose Creek, all of whom have have current capacity and, and available space to potentially bus st students to those schools. That's one option to consider. Another option that could be considered is the, the Juniper Crest area here. This is on the other side of Mountain, Mountain View Corridor. These students are already bused to the school. One option would be to simply bus those students to another elementary school, such as Harriman. And there are 182 students that currently live in that area. And does Harriman have room? Depends Harriman, on if we open the new school. If we open the new school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Harriman Dom w uh, currently has room but, and will have room, especially after the new school opens. And again, this is, we're not proposing any changes that need to be made for the next school year. And so even if with a, de a potential delay that we discussed earlier, it would still be, the timeline would still be in line being able to make this happen. That doesn't really solve the whole problem, right? Well, yeah, and I don't know if we need to move 600, but it would it would certainly solve, it'd be a part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, 182 students is the equivalent of six or seven classrooms that we're talking there. So yes, it would certainly help, but not, as you said, alleviate the, the problem altogether. And this Juniper Crest area is mostly built out except for the purple? Yeah, this it, there is a few, a few units uh, that could be developed here. It's we don't have a timeline for this, Mr. Feston, right? No, the, that purple apartment complex is it's a smaller one. It's like 80, 80 to 100 units as part of Harriman's gateway plan that they're always talking about, but I don't know. What do you yield out of a 80 to 100 in that area? 80 to 100 know? apartments, maybe, maybe 10 kids. Okay. This option would be a, a boundary change for those. Yes. Students. Yeah, we're, we would be with this option. We would be talking about a pocket bus option because it's not contiguous. That area mm -hmm. would not be contiguous with any of our other proposed elementary sites. We put our Harriman Elementary on there because they have room. It could be we could look at other options such as Bluffdale or Rose Creek or or something else. Um, but but yes, yeah, this would be an, a non-contiguous boundary change, and we would refer to that as a pocket bus scenario. Just to confirm, you said that they are already being bused. They are, yes, so because they be an additional bus. That's correct. They they are they already board a bus. Um, instead of heading down the corridor to Ridgeview, they would head down somewhere else, potentially. The other option to look at is this area to the north and east. Uh, this is a part of Riverton City. Uh, these kids. This is Deer Deerhorn Estates and and the Pine View, Hidden Pines area that we've, we've discussed. These students previously went to Bluffdale. Um, they are also bused. And so students north of this um, and east of the canal could be potentially moved to Bluffdale. There are only 34 students in that area currently. If we were to move them to Bluffdale, could that be a permanent arrangement? When and they would have to be bused there. Is, is that yeah, within? I, th I think if they move to Bluffdale, they would still be. I would believe that area is still bus eligible. And are they bused already? They are currently bused. Are they not, Mr. Festin? They are. Yeah. The one thing to keep in mind with this area is, you see here my, where my mouse is hovering. This is 138th South. If this if this road were to ever open up, um, they would lose their bus eligibility to Ridgeview. Um, 150th, if that ever opened up, that could also lose bus eligibility to review because as it stands right now, they have to go out and about, down 134th and down the corridor, which puts them in excess of 1.5 miles. And that road's slated to open next year, is that correct? I have a timeline for that road uh, to open up at 138 that I know of. Yeah, I, I'm not aware either. I know the, the western portion of the Riverton end of the development was at their planning commission last week. Uh, for approval, so that will start start seeing building in there in the spring. Uh, that would require the, of course, the joint efforts of both cities because we're 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 crossing in the Harriman, Bluffdale, and Riverton is kind of the the. Uh, that is the boundary, isn't it? One hundred thirty eighth is the boundary between Harriman and Riverton, and then on the other side of Welby Jacobs, on at some point there is is Harriman. Okay. 
Okay, so another area here that we discussed um, down here circled is the area to the, of students south of Real Academy. We, um, right now, this area is also bused. Um, it is in excess of 1.5 miles. We could look at uh, busing those students to other schools, including Harriman, Bluffdale, Rose Creek, as potential options. I want to be cautious, again, just throwing out there the potential and just that these are considerations. Um, this area does yield a higher student rate. We have 275 students in that area. Mr. Robinson asked about portables earlier. Uh, currently, we have six portables on site. This aerial view shows only three. The ones that you see there in blue are, are to represent the, the portables that are currently there. We could look at adding, an well, for next year, we anticipate needing to add four, maybe five portables to this area. The other thing to keep in mind with Ridgeview and, and Ms. Gadosh is here as the administrator of schools over this area is that they do have, as she's talked with the principal, they do have uh, some classrooms, that two of which are, are um, used as a preschool currently, another one of which is used as a STEM pullout area. It's a classroom, but it's being used as a STEM pullout. Um, and so we could look at, at moving some programs and potentially using that STEM pullout classroom as well, which would help mitigate and offset the need for, for additional portables as well. So talked a lot about the effects of portables and how many is too many. Are we comfortable with this or is this an extreme response? have it in three Harriman schools already so yeah we we, we have had Harriman. that if um, based on the conversations that we've had previously <laughs> with the board and 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 establish some some comfort levels this would be the um, oh help me Scott I can't remember the reasonable maximum reasonable maximum is is, is that it's we've ten. established as 10 portables at a school we are beyond reasonable maximum in in some of our schools currently so we certainly could go beyond that as you see here in the, from the aerial view, the blacktop would be chewed up from portables, and uh, that's that's always a, uh, a, a just a, a, an important consideration. Four squares. You can see they're painted there, around the world as well. <laughs> as the states there, you can see the United States. Learning geography at recess is always a good idea. All right, um, I just want to uh, review again the, and summarize the considerations that we talked about. Ridgeview can absorb growth for next school year. This would be potentially options that we'd exercise for the year of 23 to 24. Pocket busing students um, in the area that is mostly undeveloped would mean that you're literally busing students that are within a minute or two walk of the school boundaries, or the, sorry, the school property. Um, we would need to give notification to the cities and the residents of the schools that are potentially impacted. And I want to just impress uh, that uh, labor, material costs, supply chains, and economies can all change the projections that we try really hard to, to get right. And uh, that goes along with housing affordability, which can also impact yield, student yields. Those are the options that we've just gone over to summarize of those areas that we could consider. We're open to any questions and any discussions there um, that the board may have. Can I add an area concern uh, consideration? Um, we don't know the next elementary school we're going to build. There's two possible sites that could offset this area that we own. And so that's something to take into consideration. We don't want to move someone only and have to move them back to the same school. But the most likely site is five years away? Depends on when we want to build it. The, the property around it, the development would be five years the away. The Horsley property is probably five years away, but okay. the Riverton property is not. If you know, uh, let me go back to the map here. If you can. If you'll rec it's not on this oops let me just fast forward to that one there so you can't see the riverton property that is here but if you head up mountain view corridor to the north and it's the at the intersection of mountain view corridor and 126 it's right behind where currently stands a big old tires the next stop line that's those fields yep we used to call it the maverick area now we call it the big old tire area <laughs> <laughs> on the right side of the road Yeah. 
And Marilyn, as I understand Finance Committee's recommendation, we have enough that we could finance an elementary school. Is that correct? At this point, that is correct. Yeah, I, I, I wonder that too, because, you know, the, the height of this growth, we need space for about 500 more students to help Ridgeview, but more growth to fill up a school will be coming farther west and south of this south. area. Yes, yep. So do we put a Band-Aid on until our property is available? Or do we choose a less effective property that would give us some space? Or do we boundary change? Where do you put them on a boundary change? Yeah, there's just no, there's I mean, not a lot of space out there. Can't bring them west in any scenario. So the couple of the options on here involve I mean, Harriman Elementary, that there would be room for that one section. How long? Is there a point that Harriman Elementary can only take that section? No, Harriman Elementary remains, af after this boundary change, will remain uh, pretty much growth locked and, and, and stable. But the problem is your pocket busing. Transitional drivers and buses. Well, you're, you're, they're, are, they're, already they're already bust. It's just that's true, they are. It's just that we don't have. Pocket, bu pocket bus situation, not just a one-year pocket bus situation, right, which right. we don't typically do. And then what about Bluffdale Elementary? They could potentially have room for some more, but how long does that room last? Uh, I, again, Bluffdale is, is fairly stable, but they are larger. There's, there's less room there. There's uh, between 100 and 150 student, student uh, difference between their capacity and their enrollment. Well, they That's, can handle the 34. They could handle the 34. And there is potential space. Bluffdale has had you know, more portables in the past um, than they have now. And I think, what are they? Yes. They, they, do, they do currently get six buses a day into their parking lot, so that, that's also a, a space consideration as well during pickup and drop-off. Yep. When, so when we're looking at the students south of Real Academy, the 275, they couldn't all go to Bluffdale. There'd have to be some to Harriman and some to Rose Creek, which again would be pocket busing. They, they could they could if we increase the number of portables at Bluffdale again. As we've discussed okay. that, that would I mean any moving that entire section to one particular area could be challenging. You might have to get out the scalpel and carve you know uh, some boundary lines there. And uh, would they fit at Mountain Point? Again, it would probably have to be a combination of things because we don't have 275 seats available currently at, at any of the schools we've talked about today. Um, without ex without portable additions and, and other considerations, we'd have to. Where is the line south of that area? Because I know that uh, Board Member Young was so smart in the boundary changes to gobble up a lot of that area into Mountain Point. So where is, because the map kind of misses it here. Yeah. Is that neighborhood the end? Yeah. Th that, th it, it is. It goes just to the the edge of the sewer plant. Yeah, there's a sewer plant just south of that and then an electric uh, uh, plant right below that. So th what you see there is really the end of of a lot of growth and development on that side. So there's no more planned communities right now? Not at this point. You see this, this area here... Um, is, is a plant, it's, it's undeveloped currently, but that's going to be uh, consumed by Salt Lake Community College at some point in the future. At least that's the plan. Uh, Mr. Thomas or Mr. Ostrom, would you come up to the table and just talk to me a little bit about the Horsley property? So we stay in close contact with James Horsley. He calls oh, every couple of months just to give, give us an update. Um, I'm grateful that President Miller was able to go for a ride with us up there today to see see exactly where it was at and the condition. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be a spot that if I took any of you up there, you'd say, what were we thinking? But <laughs> it's going to require some mass grading, and we were all aware of that in the, in the agreement. And I think it was strategically placed so that when they do continue 
with that um, with that development that uh, you know it's going to be on some capital roads um, but but we basically placed it in the middle of where really nobody can do anything with it until they find us the right spot until they take care of us but I do believe it's it's at least five years out I think when we bought it didn't we say six or seven and I would imagine being very optimistic would be four and there just isn't a lot of movement on it I think one of the questions I have is if we did a Moab, you know, a South End Moab, <laughs> where we're, I mean, if we're shifting boundaries to several significant schools so that we're not pocket, pocket busing, but if we move enough boundaries around, can we accommodate all these students without building a new school or not? And, and how long? And, and I realize that may take some <laughs> yeah. research. I don't expect be, you to answer that yeah. today. We'd want, to, we'd want to research that before you gave any definitive answer. But yes, <laughs> yes, we could do that. I could tell you the four schools in my area that boundary that are all over capacity. And the only reason we're leaving them over capacity is because they're projected, they're landlocked, and they're projected to lower the growth. So you right. mess with that and put more in there. That So that would be Foothills, Black uh, Bridge. Midas Creek and Silvercrest could not absorb any more growth. No, we'd have it'd be shifted. It'd have to be direction. the other direction. It sounds direction. like towards the Harriman Bluff Del Rose Creek Mountain Point area. That being said, Mountain Point is having some some growth down in the river bottoms as well. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Students are starting we to. We expected that. Yeah. Mountain Point yep. is on the schools to watch. Yeah. So, which makes the Horsley property even more important to get moving. It seems to me a long-term solution. The Horsley property will go a long way to solve a lot of these problems, but getting to the Horsley property is going to be the challenge. What do we do from now until the time that school can open? And, and is there a boundary change that will take care of that need? Or are we going to, or should we be considering building a new school on the Riverton property? And now, we need, a new need school data. would need to be decided relatively soon. If we're looking at a boundary change, this doesn't happen until next school year. No decision would have to be made on a, on a boundary change until next school year. But if we're going to decide to move forward with building a school, that decision would need to be made soon. Why couldn't a boundary change be done soon also? Because it seems to me like anything that doesn't have a home on it right now should be carved out immediately and pocket bust so then you're moving in you know you're going to be pocket bust they haven't formed any relationships in the school they're not attached to that i would much rather move somebody who's building a new home and hasn't been in the school than to to move people who are already in the school the only area that that really applies to is the mountain ridge development correct correct at the point yeah and then we're taking an area that wouldn't need a bus correct don't have any buses or bus drivers. <laughs> These people in this area, the original people, all were pocket bust for many years. First to Bluffdale and then to Bastion. So. Just had their turn or so their conditions? Well, sometimes you have to do that for high growth areas. You know, we're doing that for the West Jordan area. We're shifting people to the other side of the district because we have to. And they probably also live, some of them, close enough to a school that they can walk. But the driving factor there is uh, is room in a school, not so much, you know, the cost of a bus. But we have to have people to drive the bus in order to pocket bus. I was thinking of doing it. <laughs> Problem solved. I think that's a separate. <laughs> I think that's a separate issue. Yeah. 
but we, it has to be considered. Yep, it does. So in the currently developing area there, right around the school, there are eight current students that live there, and there are an additional 20 or so that are on permit pending their moving in. So there are existing students in, in that housing already. So well, you're saying 28 students are already at the school? Yes. But still, they're newcomers. They haven't probably formed their relationships as much. As, as people that have been there for a while. So let's build the Riverton School and pocket bus them there to a brand new open school. And I'm okay if we need the school. If we're building the school to solve this problem, okay. But what, one of the things that we cause with the Riverton School is these people then permanently have to cross 13400 South. And there'll never be a way to to do away with that. So I hope when we make the decision, we can look at some long-term issues and say, is 134th could it be a hard boundary? If we could ever make that a hard boundary, that would be ideal. But I certainly wouldn't want to live on the wrong side of 134th and have my kid crossing that street every single day. That's, that street's going to get worse rather than better, and it's already horrible. But... If we need it, then that's great. But if, it, if we're building it just to solve a housing problem at this school, then I'm wondering if that's a smart decision. But, if, but there is some over, overgrowth in the Midas Creek area and some of those others, so we kind of need to step back and look at it a little bit broader to make that decision to build that school. And I think we've seen what happens when we overbuild an area. I was just going to say that. ages out. And I'm just wondering if moving towards Riverton is that. That's what I was wondering, yeah. Could we ask for that broader study to see if long-term projections, whether or not that school would require us to, could it sustain itself without taking this neighborhood permanently? Because I kind of like, the boundary of 134th for Ridgeview in the long run. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it definitely makes sense. And the students could walk. If we have to pocket bus some kids for three or four years to make 134th the boundary, I think it's worth it. You know, but, but if we need the other school without needing that area for a permanent, then I'm all for building that school now because we could temporarily move them over. I have no problems with that. It's the permanent, especially if they're within walking distance. I can tell you there are no other schools on the watch list, which tells me that if we opened up Riverton, we would have to just have a whole domino effect. We would have to have a whole Moab where everyone's boundaries get shifted that direction And the problem is we've tried to say also Mountain Ridge or yeah, Mountain View would also be a permanent boundary. So it, it doesn't permanently solve any of the overcrowding on the west side of Mountain View unless we back off of that. I don't know which is better to cross, Mountain View or 134th. So I'm going to say something, Daryl. I need you to react to this. <laughs> I will. <laughs> what if what if the Riverton property didn't have a boundary and was completely a pocket bust school? Long term. Long term. What if we admit that Harriman will grow faster than with the, we don't have room in Harriman and that there will always be a need to pocket bus a neighborhood or several neighborhoods? and the Riverton didn't have a boundary associated with it, it was just the destination for the pocket bus neighborhoods. I, I'm all for that because you also have uh, the Daybreak and Olympia Hills areas, and so, I mean, I guess you could make that be our... No boundary. Our over it's just our school. overflow school. So question. If we're making a permanent pocket bus school, why don't we send it to a school that we already have that's getting low? Another great question. Good question. Well, part, part, of those, school? part of those problems are the ones that are open are super far away, especially for elementary kids. Copper Canyon is 
I mean, I'm not saying it's close by any stretch, but it's reasonable. If you're not the parent, it's reasonable. Well, any pocket busing is not reasonable to a parent. I mean, Riverton, the Riverton property located off of a major corridor is highly accessible. It's a great location if you build an innovative school. So, like, if you created it, it could be eventually turned into be an innovative school. Right. If it were a pocket, if it were an overflow school with no boundary until that wasn't needed, and then it becomes a Jordan School District innovative school with no boundary. I mean, it's an ideal location for that kind of a, you know, school. My hesitation with that is there's really no sense of community. If you have different spots being pocketed, you have no sense of communi community. And maybe that we can't determine. I don't that know right that now. we can. Yeah, I think we're going to lose the sense of community no matter what, because the alternative is we're. I I think people that choose an innovative route like Alps or um, J Tech, you kind of give that up. You kind of say, okay, I know that I'm not going to be with my friends, but the program's more important than going to school with my friends. The cr question is, can we create something innovative enough to first of all pull people into, and then second of all, if we were to bring people, they would be happy to be there. But, I mean, I wouldn't be oh, happy going down that avenue until the innovative school we've already started took off. Like, do we want to start from scratch on a whole new one before we filled our first program? But innovative that's, school. that's the route that I would be on. Oh, I think That's I think a magnet school. I think the innovation that I th I look at is a whole lot different than majestic, but. but that's that's the magnet school that this board chose. Yeah, that's the one the board chose. I just I think it's we have enough money to build an elementary school. We own a piece of property. We have a need. I just wonder if the best decision is to very soon, if not now, move forward with building an elementary school on a property we already own, and then we can use that school as an overflow school with no boundary. Mr. Larson. I, I don't know if this is splitting hairs or not. I just wanted to add this to the conversation that um, in order for us to be reimbursed by the state for any busing costs, it has to have a boundary. Now that boundary can be a pocket bus boundary, but it has to have a boundary. So um, if there is no designated boundary, then there is no reimbursement by the state. That, so you could do pockets and say, here's the, this is the boundary. Right. This is the boundary. I just mean the school wouldn't have a neighborhood boundary. Yeah. You could have boundaries all over the district for it, but it wouldn't necessarily be a neighborhood boundary where it resides. So we would take all of Olympia Hills, all of Daybreak, all of our needs, all of our current areas. need where we ha can't fit in a school and we pocket bus to our overflow school. Mr. Van Komen. Uh Just a reminder, not uh, that it matters, but um, that property will not have impact fees. We negotiated that into the agreement for the property if we build on it. And it has infrastructure around it, so it shouldn't be that hard. We could open just in time for the overflow. It would be nice to have an extra building, a floating building, so to speak. I think we have plenty of those, though. Yes. I think that we have some real issues in some of our buildings where the enrollment is going low, and I understand it's not the most ideal um, locations, but I also, it's very difficult for me to stomach um, building a new school with taxpayers' money in an area that we have potential to have as an innovative school in the future. Um, when we can utilize some of the buildings that we have it's just some but not a single building we would have to use multiple buildings to do the same thing well, if we have our eye on an eventual build of the horsley property maybe that's okay 
I just feel like we need to make sure we're building in the right location maybe is a more important priority for me than the right time. Maybe we can make a temporary solution of some existing buildings and then build the new elementary school where we actually need it. Yep. President Miller, um, if I may just say, if in talking about the Port Horsley property, there are options. We've rough sketched a lot of potential options tonight. There would be options to, to move move students for a temp even if it was temporary add portables to the current school of ridgeview and that would allow us to kind of wait until the horsley property area was was build ready um, again it, they may not all be comfortable options they may not all be um, popular but there there would be options that we could we could uh, flesh out a little further and, and that would allow us to wait until the horsley property was was completed as well just wanted to throw that out there and when is the Olympia Hills development supposed to start? Because we do own property there also. Uh, the last the last communication I, I heard was probably three years out. They're still negotiating okay. water rights, um, infrastructure construction. So before we start to see homes there, my guess is about three years. So it, it could be before the Horsley property, but not much before. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, they could be pretty close in timelines. It's a lot more desirable to build on. And I'll just throw out there that the west side of West Jordan has growth coming much sooner than that. Antelope Canyon's going to be overfilled in a hurry. Okay, so it seems like we need a lot more information. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've thrown out a lot of good ideas. Um, so I'll, I'll just start right there and maybe we already have this. Where is our next elementary school needed? What was our highest need? Was it this area? Yes. Ridgeview. And how does that compare to Antelope Canyon when we looked at that? Antelope Canyon's on the list as well. And Mountain Point, you say? Mountain Point is on the list. We don't have... Do we have property in the Mountain Point area? No. We talked to the Ivory Project planner for the area by Antelope Canyon, and he said next year. Antelope Canyon will have 1,100 students by 2025. So it seems like me, to me there's a couple of things we could do. Number one, I... I wonder if that blo that Riverton area right now that's coming there, if that we should consider moving them to Bluffdale because the canal is a good line, you know? And so that's the first thing I think that we should explore. And the second of, can we just carve out everything, including that area up on Juniper Crest, anything that is not under, you know, currently occupied to move them to a pocket location of our choice. And th to me, doing that is the most important. That was, the second one's probably more important than the first one. Um, but the first one, it seems to me, long term, that area is probably better suited with Bluffdale Elementary. So can I ask a question about what you were just talking about? So if you were just talking about the Juniper Crest area that is not developed, how many students are we projecting? Uh, may, yeah, maybe, maybe so 10. They're all apartments. Like 10 students to yeah. a whole different school. If we're just talking the students that have not moved there already, if we're talking about the students that live in that whole area, we're talking 182. And I'm more concerned about moving them because if Horsley is next, then they're moving them back, I, uh, which we may anyways, but I mean... You're interested in moving the undeveloped Mountain Ridge area and having them pocket bus to another school? Yes. As soon as possible. That's, to me, that's my highest priority is to take unincorporated ones where people haven't been in the school and develop a relationship with other students and teachers to move them into pocket busing. We're already doing that. We set precedence with that. The West Jordan area, I think, 
that saves us something. It still will be a very overcrowded school. It still will need to be addressed, but it will buy us some time. And with the least effect on ripping up relationships that already exist. And in the past, if the board has asked us to do that, the process we followed is just to meet with the school community council at all of the impacted schools and then bring back any feedback we receive to the board before a decision is made. Since you don't really have residents to serve. Yeah. Yeah. So, President, I think there's one question we're all asking and need to be able to answer. Could a new school on the Horsley property solve Harriman's situation? If we had, in, I, I would imagine you ought to consider not just, you know, the busy roads, but if we put a new school, at if we had a Horsley property school right now, would all of this growth fit into those schools? And if the answer to that is no, then Riverton becomes a necessity. That's if the right. answer to that is yes, then we're building Riverton simply to solve a current problem. And I think we have to answer that question first. If there were a school on the Horsley property right now, would all of this challenging growth in Harriman be solved? Long term. Long term. You're saying if we're going to need this, the if big we're going to need the Riverton anyway. anyway, then why not build it now and utilize it until then? A lot of empty space along Porter, down to Porter Rockwell. So we need a study of the growth in the Harriman area and what elementary schools we need to accommodate them, not counting Olympia, right? So I would ask for two things. Just add up the numbers, total projected numbers citywide, total school capacity. That's the first number. Does it fit? And then the second consideration is, okay, can we reasonably carve the boundaries so that 134th remains a hard boundary? Can we reasonably carve the boundaries? So would it ideally fit? If there were no streets and roads, could we just fit the number of students in the number of seats that we have? If the answer to that is no, then I don't know that we really need to go for, for, further. If the answer to that is yes, then let's say, okay, let's be realistic. Can we work within the, the boundaries that we, the limitations that we have could we reasonably make boundaries so that with a horsley property they would fit in our seats if the answer to that question is no then i think we move forward and, and keep it in in understanding that we would like mountain uh, view to be a hard bound mountain view so 130 temporarily bust them across but eventually we would want that to be a hard boundary because i don't know if having kids cross mountain view is any better than 134th and they're both bad decisions but and i would just add kind of as a sidelight are there any uh options that we could utilize to get us to the horsley property that wouldn't uh, make us build a school on Riverton. That, that's just kind of a sidelight. What could we do? Additional portables? Could we? Yeah. There are other options besides just po pocket busing, I think. To get us by for the next five, six years. Well, and we need to talk to Harriman with some very serious talks and say, what's your exact timeline? And I think that needs to be board to council. I'd be surprised if they know yet, but would you like to would you like to reach out to them? I already have a meeting in January, so <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, yeah, and and they may not, and if that's their honest answer, like we have no idea, then that's good because that's good information for us. And I'll be very open with them, like we, you know, we um, we don't want promises that can't be kept. We we want to make sure that that infrastructure the hard thing is we're building schools without existing infrastructure which is always difficult you know the the riverton property already has infrastructure around it it wouldn't be very hard to tie into it but but is it the right place is it the right place that's a good question i would love to have some of the questions answered about um the west side of west jordan well i think we've got two pretty big developments that are being approved or started to build 
and so it's hard for me to say yeah let's let's build this building brand new that's arbitrary brown boundaries when we have pretty significant needs that are tangible okay so we need <laughs> another re another report at an upcoming board meeting with um Mr. Dunford, do you want to restate your points, or has someone got those down? I think it'd be helpful because there were there were several options and ideas thrown out there just to kind of clarify, so we 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 can address everything that you want us to. I would like to know number one, if we just in an ideal world with no limitations on boundaries, can the projected growth in Harriman and the number of seats we have with a Horsley property? match and i ask a clarifying question to that so when you say in harriman there are many schools in harriman that we kind of uh, when we moved boundaries and when we when we proposed boundary changes we anticipated those changes lasting a while foothills is an example but um after this next boundary change butterfield canyon would be there blackridge is an example when you say harriman do you want us to relook at those schools that we've kind of anticipated not having to 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 touch for a while or do you want us to kind of focus on the area that we've discussed tonight I, my first request would be simply a calculation of nothing new just here's the projected growth at its highest point here's the number of seats in those schools with a horsley property is the number of seats greater than the number of students I would not. I would rather not disturb those schools because all, although they're over capacity, they're all decreasing, and I would like long-term boundaries on those schools. I think that could probably take a half an hour. But when you say Harriman, do you also want Riverton? Because part of this is in Riverton. Yeah, and I would just simply Lufthale. see all the high growth areas. Okay. I just want to know, with a horsely, I, a, a theoretical horsely property, do they fit? Because if the answer to that question is no, we're still going to need another school, then it changes every other discussion we're going to have. Okay. If the answer is yes, a Horsley property would solve all of our problems. Unless the growth is south of Horsley. Yeah. I'm just saying theoretically, just theoretically. I'm not thinking boundary at all. Problems. I just want to know, would a Horsley property solve our problems? If, if the answer is yes, it would. Then we move on. If the answer is no, that to me is a totally different ballgame. The second question I would ask is, no, these schools are off limits. We're not even going to consider changes at these schools because we finally, after all this time, have set them on a course where they're, they're great. These are the schools that would be open for realignment. So my first question is an ideal. My second question is a realistic can I ask another question about that? So when you say would putting a school on the Horsley property solve the problems in the area, you're not asking for the specifics of what those boundaries may look like because that's, that's part of the trade-off is they may not, it may involve, as you said, some domino changes where you change from this school to that one and that one to the next one. But just... Can it be done, period? So what I've that, done is every what year... The board is looking yeah, for? Yeah, what I've done every year, I've looked at our total enrollment, and I've added up the total number of seats in all of our schools. And to me, that's a pretty good indication as to big picture, ideal situation, that's where we're at. So just, I'd love that information. Big picture, <laughs> ideal situation, no boundaries. Do we have the seats to match the students? Okay, the answer is yes, or the answer is no. The second question for me would be, okay, could we put a Horsley, proper, a Horsley school in here and then leaving these schools alone, could we change enough boundaries that we could fit the students? That... So one's an ideal, one's a realistic. Okay. All right, anything else that you'd like, President Miller? Um, yes, I would... And maybe this fits in with what he's already asking. But if we were to do boundary changes to the east and north, can we solve this problem? 
east and north of Ridgeview. So include those schools in the in the in the discussion, you know, in the if, area. And Expand so the long. area a little more than what Bryce had indicated there and, and include schools to the east and north of Ridgeview. A, a greater domino effect in other words. Yes. yes. Mini Moab. Back to your mini Moab. Yes. <clears throat> or could but it the, solve the, it and how long would it solve it for? A mini Moab with the Horsley property assumed. And then can I ask oh. for a separate agenda item for immediate action on un, un, um, occupied homes and to be a pocket bus? For the Mountain Ridge area. For that Mountain Ridge, Ridge view area. Mountain Ridge or whatever area. The Harriman Riverton mm -hmm. development, the 300. Because to me, that's one of the biggest priorities because that will slow the growth, at least temporarily. So you want, it, you want immediate action on that without having further information? I want that a separate. To me, the study of boundary changes and long-term growth is going to take a lot longer than to, I mean, if you wait, like even to our next meeting, we have a hundred new homes there. <laughs> I mean, it's growing so quickly. So you're, you're asking for the agenda item in our next meeting for yeah. us to discuss move and forward decide on if we want to move forward with the boundary change of the unbuilt homes. Correct. That would be involved pocket. Because I think the other item is going to take some study and some decisions to make when you're talking about building schools and, so, long-term boundary changes in preparation for that discussion do you want information about which schools they would go to and how many buses we would need probably anything else C can i ask can i kind of summarize that again i may reserving the right to re-summarize later <laughs> <laughs> we'll change it later so you'll have to <laughs> okay so far a separate item that explains what pocket busing would look like as an immediate solution for the coming fall that would not undeveloped for yeah. undeveloped areas that would include I would think where certain areas would be bused to and what the timeline would be for talking with school community councils and returning to the board to get a final decision correct so is this just a shot across the bow if you develop here you're gonna go to that school just be warned well, most of those homes are already priced sold, so I don't know if we're pre-warning them or not. But to me, it's, again, it comes to, do we want to rip students out of where they've already built a relationship with students in the school versus people moving into a new area haven't built those relationships yet? Should they build them at another location first? To me, that's, that's it's a lot easier to move into an area you know, and have to be on a bus and go to a different area for a while. This whole area did this for a while. Um, they can build a relationship with people moving in around them, but it's a lot harder to take existing people who have been in a school out of their school, especially if there's any anticipation that they'll come on back. What we're doing in West West Jordan. Mm -hmm. Can you also bring data on that, you know, 360, how many of those have already been sold? And how many is left still sure. to be developed? And I'd like to know how that impacts our transportation department. That's a good Yeah, that would, too. like we said earlier, we have over 1,300 units that remain to be, you know, we have about 100, 250 units that have been uh, given permits and, and purchased with over 1,300 pending. Just to restate, not going against the idea, but the, the issue is that we would be busing students who otherwise wouldn't need to be bused. So we're increasing the need for busing where we are already not able to meet needs and are doing double runs in a number of areas. So Correct, but we're sa we potentially are saving ourselves from building a school that doesn't need to be built. So there is a, there is right. a concern with the busing for sure. Sure, it's just a supply chain, yep. different mm -hmm. version of supply chain issues, I suppose. So number one is a pocket busing plan along with all of the 
logistics that would be involved and the potential impact to people who have already purchased homes. And so I bought a home. I expected to go to the school I can walk to in two minutes, but now I'm being bused to another school. So what would that look like for the public? And then what would be the, um, the real impact? And I'm concerned that pocket busing doesn't bring the benefits that we think it might. I, I don't think it's as big an impact as it needs to be. But um, Explain that to us. Yeah, I, I'll start by saying just the just the idea of you're literally taking kids that live potentially touching the school's property and not and not having them go there. And when we start talking about 1,300 units yet to be developed, that is a lot of buses. It's a lot of routes. It's a lot of drivers. Um, it's a lot of logistics to move them um, something away from them. I mean, so pocket busing is difficult anytime um i just think that's it's a key, a key consideration especially when you're you're literally getting on a bus and po- potentially passing the school that you that you live next to but we have that all over our district like i have people that live across the street from black ridge elementary that go to harriman elementary and we're moving some people in fact harriman built a road for us um so that students could get to black uh, butterfield canyon and yet we're moving them to the new school so some we always want someone to go to the school nearest to them, somewhere they can walk and all of that. Unfortunately, there's other issues like, does the school fit you? You know, and we're, we're kind of in a unique situation too because we built up on a mountain and, and some of those schools are the highest we can go and have a flat piece of property. And so... Well, we can continue you know, to this debate sure. on our agenda sure. item in yeah. the... So well, we'll, we have time sure. to ponder that. I did have one more. Um, I, I still would like updated numbers considering the two new developments in West West Jordan, if yeah. that would be possible. Yes. I'm yeah, interested so in you that. You can also bring, just let's review the projections of West West Jordan to see when a new elementary school is going to be needed there. I, I am meeting with West Jordan city planners tomorrow, so I will bring that up. Woods Ranch but, will be uh, oh, approved at their next city council meeting. So I don't know if yeah, that's Thursday night. So that, is that on west of one eleven? You one eleven? Yeah. So Council Ridge. I've had actually, a lot that, of their community reaching out to me with concerns. Wood Ranch is actually in Antelope Canyon's boundaries. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of that area. In north district. So help me understand what you're asking for that wasn't given to us on October twelfth. A review of it. A review of it, but apparently this is hastening, and I want to see what impact it might have. That's all. We can do that. Yep. Okay, can I go through that yep. list? That'd be great. Number one, a separate agenda item that shows pocket busting, pocket busing, sorry, um, how it, would, how it would impact parents that have already purchased homes that haven't been built yet, all of the impacts, how many more buses we would need, where all, we'd of, send them to. all the implications, where we'd send them to. And then one, uh, information about the, the Horsley property, and if we added a school, in, if we just count students and seats in the whole area, does that solve the problem? And then number three is which schools would we include in a boundary change, any more limited boundary change that we could make it work. So if we included these, not boundaries specifically, but these are the schools that would be in the mix. And then more of a mini Moab where we expanded further and did more extensive boundary changes where we're, there's maybe a chain or a domino effect of, of schools and we make a a broader proposal of what schools we could include to balance things even even more by including more schools and then an analysis of the western development in west jordan and how soon schools will be needed there so that we can have a means of comparison between the two areas i don't know that i want to look at that like to compete i know there's needs everywhere i'm just saying can we consider of Riverton build when we have 
those imminent other needs. Yeah, just a level of urgency in what the timeline looks for each of those areas. Did I capture what we're looking for? You did. Okay. Everyone else agree? Thank you. This is anticipation of the January 11th study session. Does that give you enough time? <laughs> I said I don't get a Christmas break. <laughs> We'll do the best we can. Um, I, if I you're think, not done, then think my, I think the issue that I want to separate should be January 11th. Yes. I want you to bring the other one back when you're ready to bring it back with all the information. I agree with that. Uh, so the, 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 the whether or not we're going to pocket bust the Mountain Ridge area on January 11th, if the others need more time, yeah, if uh, <clears throat> take more time. To build on what, what that would mean is, I, I mean, we would have to have the discussion at that point. If you're talking about a pocket bus boundary change, then the clock could start ticking once we notify the cities and the residents of that area on a, on a boundary change. That it would be a, the bare minimum to take effect and be approved by April Yeah, at that point. And for those listening, pocket busing refers to when you're bused through another school's boundary. So it's not contiguous. You're an island that's separated by other school boundaries so that you drive through a different school's boundary to get to your school. Clarification. Okay, does everyone have the information that they need? Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next agenda item is an update from the School Closure Policy Committee. <clears throat> This committee is uh, made up of Ms. George, Ms. Atwood, and myself, and we have met several times and had a lot of lengthy discussions on uh, how to put together a policy and, and which direction we should go with that. And, and um, sorry, it's also um, Ms. Robinson is also part of that committee. Um, so we before we go any farther, we... Uh, just wanted to bring what we've worked on so far to the board and get your feedback on it to see if if we're even heading in the right direction, if there's other factors that we should be considering in this. So um, what we are working on is attached to board docs. And if you want to pull that up, I'll, I will walk you, we'll walk through it. And um, we started out with, kind of drafting a board directive statement um, stating that we want every student to have access to high quality learning environment and we recognize there may be at times the need to reconsider the use of our buildings we strive to maximize the efficient use of district facilities while balancing the effect that changes can have on students families employees and communities when reviewing the use of district facilities consideration is given to the following and then we have our list um, there, which includes building condition, resulting in safety issues, need for investment in buildings with short-term remaining lifespan. Sometimes those conversations come up when we're discussing summer projects. Um, decreasing enrollment, supplementing general teacher FTE, special programming, transportation costs, potential for boundary changes to utilize existing buildings and new opportunities are used for district needs. And then when changes are made, our priorities to ensure that students and staff are given the best opportunity to experience a smooth transition. So if the board decides to pursue closure, the following priorities should be considered. Um, and we've had lots of debate about how to word these, so this is in a very pretty rough form right now <laughs> um, but the considerations are keeping students with as many familiar faces as possible authorizing additional FTE temporarily um, temporary transportation to ease transition creating a sense of ownership for all students at the receiving school um, such as renaming new mascots building improvements additional programs and then have a plan for the use of the closed school that provides a new opportunity or is utilized for district needs. And then we, we, 
we were working on a timeline. We're not sure if this should be part of the policy or if this should just be a procedure. Um, but it was really helpful to kind of put together a timeline to figure out how a school closure discussion would come about. And so we started it in October when we have our enrollment and capacity and projection data. We get all those reports in the fall. Um, and then at that time, the board could determine whether to direct facilities committee and or staff to bring back more information and recommendations. Uh, in the kind of March through June is when those recommendations would need to be brought forward. And the board could determine if they want to you know, act on that. And by July, August, you'd need to do your 120 day notice and get your feedback, have public hearings, and, and have a vote by December, um, January-ish, so that then everyone could be prepared for the following year. So that's our, that's our rough timeline. Jen, Nikki, do you have anything to add? No, just that I, I believe that our committee is very open to suggestions, and we're looking for any type of feedback. Um, I feel that the the conversations have been really good conversations, and we've worked it's really hard to come up with this, but we understand that there would be some changes. Yeah, yeah, very, very open to feedback. This is I not been an easy task. I personally would like to see the timeline perhaps be part of this, um, just so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, you know? Have it, have it uh, noted just like everything else that you've discussed. That's my opinion. I, I think it would be good. Okay, thank you. So this doesn't, you didn't come on a trigger point. You didn't talk about a trigger point or actually when a school closes, just things to consider. We've had extensive discussions about trigger points <laughs> and whether to include them. Um, and, and right, we don't, we don't currently have that. Just, I mean, the only trigger would be on the timeline that after receiving our enrollment capacity and projection data that, that that's a trigger to say, hey, maybe we should be considering something. Well, and I think what we were hoping would happen is that as staff is putting together those reports for us, they're considering these areas that we've identified and pointing out trigger points, if you will, as they present. You know, they know where our priorities are. They know where we want them to be mindful. And then that would be an opportunity for them. Because I think the problem with trigger points is it's too broad. We've got so many different situations that might be a reason to have this conversation. And so in this way, I think it allows for all of those scenarios. So we're writing a policy to tell staff what things to consider, but not giving them any help as to, at this point, a school should be closed. We're writing a policy that says, here are things to consider, and here's a timeline. Yes, but expound. What would you like to see in it? I, I, honestly, I just I worry that we're making a policy that's not going to be helpful. I, I don't know how this changes what we normally do. What new direction is anyone going to have because of this policy? Now, if we just feel like we need to have a policy, let's put one on the books and let's go, then I'm, I'm fine with that, but I'm asking myself, I'm not sure what the objective of this policy is. Is it that we haven't considered these things, and so we're telling ourselves and future boards, make sure you consider these things? Is that the reason for the policy is, before you close a school, make sure you consider these things? Then I would just be upfront and say that. Because it seems to me you've got things to consider, what to do, things to consider, make sure you do these things, and here's the timeline to do it in. 
But I keep asking myself, I don't know what this policy is going to really do. In my opinion, what the, this policy does is make it so that nobody's caught off guard when a school is brought up for discussion. They already knew these are the factors that our board has agreed to consider. And so when those factors are brought up, you're not caught off guard. And I agree with that. I think that the communities need to have something tangible that they can look at to have a good understanding of exactly what is being considered. Community schools, it's just, I think, if we have something tangible, if we have a policy, then they can know that these, all of these things were considered in making the decision. It's not playing favorites. It's not picking on someone. We have a plan in place. And I do believe that it also helps future boards to be able to say, to keep going back to that policy and saying, yes, as a reminder, these are the reasons. But wouldn't future boards just write, write their own policy? Like, this shouldn't come up very often. In a district like ours, like, we have one area. So we're spending all this time writing a policy for future boards that probably won't even need it and probably throw it out if we did. My question is, are we going to need it, and are we going to do it, and what's our plan? You know, because if we're writing this for a future board, I have no interest. If we're writing this for us, I have an interest. For us and future boards. Sorry that I missed that statement. Well, no, yeah. it's not. I'm Some not. of us could be on the future boards. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Jen, if it wasn't really targeted towards you, but <laughs> I just think that in a district that is quickly, quickly growing, I don't think that we'll be addressing school closures on a constant basis like you would in many of the other districts in the state. Now, if we're in some of those other districts, um, I, I would definitely think we need a, a future policy that we're kind of following. But to me, this is a one-time, let's study this. I hope that if we were to study this, that we would solve the problem for the next decade. You know. The difficult part in that for me is that we have had multiple conversations that we are the district that has the very growing and the, and the area that is not. So I just think just to have this in place would be such a... Yeah, and I'm, yeah, a future board rewrites the policy, absolutely, but I know the work that we have put in just to establish something and how many questions we've had to ask and the conversations that we've had to have. It, something like this would have been very helpful in conversations in the past for me. No doubt. And if I'm understanding Mr. Dunford correctly, I hope I am, I think what he's asking is maybe a step further mm -hmm. and maybe the trigger point at which the enrollment dips below this number. Um, is the mm -hmm. building older than this number? You know, so that we have some specifics that we're working with. Is that correct? That is correct. So I'll just throw out. So, so if I say is the enrollment below this number at this school, then that doesn't give me the opportunity to say, we have five schools really close together that have declining populations. And that should play into the decision of closing one school. And so that's what I meant by saying, if we define it too tightly, then we limit our ability to be nimble with different scenarios. We don't have to close it. You're not saying you have to close a school at this trigger point. You're saying this is the trigger point where the conversations are had. The decision is up to the board. So let's take the example of an area that has several schools that have declining numbers. How would you define that? How would you say, okay, if there's one school that has a five-year projection that's declining below this number, that's one scenario. Okay, but what if all of these schools are declining, they're not as high as if it was a one school, but it's an area issue. I just think 
How do you write specifics for every scenario? So you're asking, I think you're asking two conversations. When does a school go on a list for consideration and what discussions do you have once it hits the list? And it seems to me you're writing a single policy for both of those. And I'm saying, I'm not going to, this is what's going to guide the discussion once the school's on the list. But this is the policy that's going to put the school on the list. And I think that is... If it's worth writing a policy that says, here are things to consider, great, then add that policy. But this policy isn't necessarily going to make significant changes so for me. Do you have any specific ideas that you would suggest? I would, we do. I mean, this is sort of the trigger list, this first bullet point. It's just not specific. Right. Because it says decrease enroll enrollment over time, building capacity and enrollment of nearby schools. There comes a point where well, there comes a point where this school is financially ineffective, or this school is academically ineffective because we can't offer the classes that it's not fair to the students because we can't offer these classes, or the cost is ineffective because we're paying this much to educate. There comes a point where there are some natural trigger points. They're not all of those have been identified, just not specified. And that's what I'm saying is if all you're doing is saying, here's a policy of things to consider, then I'm fine. You've written a great policy. But I don't know what we're going to do with that other than, well, we, we considered those things. We did. We considered those things. What I'm looking for is this is when a school is on the list. So public, so community, everyone, parents know our school is, is, is here. Now, whether or not it gets closed is a totally different discussion, but what schools are on the trigger list should be a pretty f straightforward, here are the schools that have hit the closure trigger list for these reasons. And the board can say, well, we're not going to close that one, obviously. And the, we're not going to close that one, obviously. But, ooh, I didn't know that school was on the list for that reason. That's new information for me. So something to trigger an agenda item where the board says, here's a couple schools. Do we want to consider closing them or not? And that's the board what, says, yep, let's look into it or nah, we're good. That's what we have for we've got a school to watch in terms of growing. Mm -hmm. That we know that I can tell you what schools we're watching because they've hit the list. And as soon as they've hit the list, man, they get my radar. And that's an easy one. Here's a school that we're watching because of the enrollment. I just would love to say, here are schools that we're watching because of these reasons. Did you know that that school has a growing safety issue that we can't solve with summer project funds? Ooh, I did not know that. That's on my list. So in terms of capacity and declining enrollment, I feel like saying, are we supplementing teacher FTE to provide two teachers per grade? I think that is a fairly specific indicator. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't want to say, are we at 50% or lower? You know, I'm more interested in do the, do the children have choices? Do we, are we providing them with a robust educational opportunity at that school? And I want you to tell me what those trigger points are. So I'm asking you, does that feel specific enough to you? It may be one. It may be one. I'm, I'm comfortable with that being on the list, but I'm saying I don't see that this policy as written is going to be extremely helpful to me. Okay, so... so You've mentioned decreasing enrollment being one of them. What number would you set that at? Or does um, it have to be a number? Can the, are we supplementing FTE to provide two teachers per grade? Well, maybe it could be a declining re uh, enrollment of this percentage for this many years. Or does it go on the watch list because we're supplementing FTE? Me, yeah, I think it does. Because yeah. that hits two things. That hits declining enrollment. It also hits... Not cost efficient. 
and yeah. availability well, for on students. Maybe three, because I also want them to have a robust learning experience. I want them to be able to have variety in their school and an enriching experience. And I think that happens when we aren't stagnant with teachers. What if we say, you know, looking down at our timeline, that sometime October, November, along with discussing capacity enrollment, we also um, have a watch list brought to us at that time. And those these bullet points are the things we consider in order to put schools on a watch list so that we know specifically what the watch list is. And then as a board, we can say, just like we do in the growth areas, here's on our watch list. Do we need to build a new school now? We can say, here's our watch list. Do we want to consider doing anything now? That's the policy that That's would be helpful to me. The conversation we had about a watch list is just leaving a school constantly on a list. In year this fair, year. this concern, the the teachers are trying to transfer because they don't feel like they have job security. Does that hurt the students of the school and the academic environment, the learning environment, by having a watch list? That is, we did have a pretty robust conversation about that. Because that even just having the conversation each and every year about specific schools is is disconcerting and but yeah. but it also tells them that we're talking about it yeah, that we're and, yeah but but the only reason we're having it over and over again because we've never solved it so if we were brave enough just to solve it you wouldn't need a policy i mean i was on a committee 10 20 years ago with the jordan district before the split and we actually had a whole committee and they set the parameters we looked at things like the condition of the building whether or not the property was sellable you know, a, a variety of different things. And we're writing a policy that may or may not be able to use. So again, I just asked a question, like, are we gonna use it? And if we're gonna use it, then let's go down that road and say, let's solve this. If we really solved it, this discussion shouldn't come up for another decade, you know? But the problem is, is we've never solved it. And so it will keep coming up every two years. I do feel like the a reason why we didn't solve it is because we didn't have a roadmap of how to solve it. Mm -hmm. well, let me go back to the, the watch list. Are other board members interested in having a yearly watch list brought to the board for discussion? I'm not. Because I just think let's solve it. And then it doesn't have to be on a yearly basis that we're re-reviewing it again. Uh, uh, looking for schools to close every year just alarms people. And like, I think we could be brave enough to sell it one big time. And I don't think it would ha be back on a list every single year, you know? But that's me, like, I to me it's something you don't keep in check like every year but maybe every decade or half a decade you're looking at that once you take action I think so but it's what you said it takes a lot of planning and a very organized approach in order to take action on something as traumatic as the school closure I, I thought it was effective what they they did 20 years ago and creating a committee that looked at this board members could be on it or not you know I think they brought an outside company to guide us through on that mm -hmm. they didn't take all the recommendations that we made but it was a very one thing I have to say is it was a very very deep broad discussion and solved their problems for a while you know how does everyone else feel about a watch list Maybe it's not annually. Maybe a committee reviews a watch list more often and then just brings us something if there's concerns. I mean, that, that would be appropriate for facilities to do probably yearly and maybe finance, but to write it into policy and stuff, I don't know. We'll continue discussing that. Uh, for me, the most important part of the policy is that next set of bullet points. Mm -hmm. um, it, if I could go into a school closure knowing 
you know, if our staff knows that as a board, these are our priorities. We don't want a school closure to be considered unless these bullet points can be met. Um, that's, that's the most important about, that's what this policy accomplishes to me more than anything. Any thoughts on those bullet points? Are we on the right track with those? Okay. This is really helpful. Any other thoughts, ideas? Do we keep going as a committee? Okay. Um, we will appropriate that if people had any other thoughts or ideas just to go ahead and email us so that we could uh, have at least conversation about their thoughts and yeah uh, thank you for bringing that up please do please call email we welcome the feedback okay uh we will take a break now We've got 20 minutes until our general session starts. Thanks. <laughs>